At the Pennsylvania Leadership Conference, we're going to have a panel on combating environmental extremism. Uh, we invite you to stay tuned as we continue this afternoon. We're going to have a policy on pro-life, why leadership elections matter. We're going to talk about the Entrepreneur Protection Program a little bit later. And we have Congressman Dan Muser, and we have John Gizzi and Dr. Paul Kangor, who are going to do a segment on the state of the conservative movement in 2020. But right now, we're going to talk about combating environmental extremism. And our panel moderator is Rebecca Euler. Uh, Rebecca is the legislative director for the National Federation of Independent Business here in Pennsylvania. She advocates on behalf of Pennsylvania small businesses, uh, who Dave have certainly needed advocating uh, for in recent months. And she's worked in many areas of state government, nearly 20 years as director of policy for the Department of State and the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Rebecca was also a policy specialist at the Department of Community and Economic Development. And she started out at the American Enterprise Institute. Please welcome Rebecca Euler. Thank you so much, Loman. I'm so excited to be here today to talk about combating environmental extremism. I think this is such an important topic, and I'm so glad to have a chance to discuss it because it seems like Every morning we wake up to some doom and gloom story about the environment. And in that environment, um, it's, it's so easy to feel powerless and overwhelmed by the messages that we're hearing in the media every day and from a lot of our leaders. So I think it's an important discussion we really need to have. Today we're gonna to try to address this issue head on and discuss some of the strategies for how interested and engaged citizens can respond. So we have a distinguished and very knowledgeable panel with us today for our discussion. Uh, with us we have State Representative Chris Dush from the 66th District in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives. He represents Jefferson and Indiana counties. Um, among other positions, Representative Dush serves as Secretary of the House Environmental Resources and Energy Committee, which has been the center of a lot of debate about the role of government in energy and the environment lately. So we're very happy to have him here. Uh, Chris is also a decorated veteran from his service in the US Air Force and the Pennsylvania National Guard. Gordon Tom is a senior fellow with the Commonwealth Foundation where he's an accomplished energy writer and editor and an expert on communicating information about energy, the environment, and the role of the free market in those areas. So thank you both very much for being here. It's a pleasure. Great. Well, I thought it would be helpful to start the discussion by talking about what we mean by environmental extremism. Maybe discuss some examples. So when I think environmental extremism, the very first thing that comes to mind is uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's assertion that the world is going to end in 12 years. Uh, maybe that's just me, but that's the first thing that pops into my head. Uh, so I think we have to start there uh, because, of course, these extreme, sometimes outrageous claims are being used to justify extreme policies, including the New Green Deal, for example. Um, and that's just one example. And these policies obviously can be very harmful. So I really think we have to back, backtrack and start talking about you know, the claims that are being made and how they're being linked to these policies. So if, if we oppose or even raise questions about the claims that are being made, or the policies, we end up having to argue the merit of those claims. And not everybody is a uh, environmental scientist, so a lot of people are intimidated to argue back. Uh, so Gordon, can you talk to us a little bit about environmental extremism, how we got here, and what you think uh, is the best way to go about taking on some of these claims? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, the gloom and doomers go back a long ways. Uh, you, you, you can go back to the 1700s and probably be before that. Thomas Malthus wrote about, uh, back in the, the 18th century, wrote about how we were going to run out of food, uh, that, that farmers wouldn't be able to grow enough food for our, for our people, for the population of the world. Well, of course, we know now that there's many, many times more people in the world now, 7 billion now, and, the, uh, and there's, by percentage, there's many fewer people uh, growing food. So we've become much more productive in producing food. Now, you can jump to the 1970s uh, when I first was uh, a news reporter and people were talking about, and people were writing about, uh, the world uh, having a, an ice age and we were going to freeze to death and all kinds of bad things were going to happen. My first, personally, my, my first experience with, um, direct experience with extreme claims 
came when I was a newspaper reporter in, uh, at, uh, John, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And this health secretary, the state health secretary at the time, came through, held a news conference, and issued a, an announcement that shocked everybody. He said that Johnstown and Altoona and some other communities, I believe, were cancer hotspots. Cancer hotspots, right? And so it, we, we real sat, sat up and took notice of that. Uh, short, short story here is myself and another reporter dug into it. Eventually, the Centers for Disease Control looked at, at the, these claims and found that when you factor in the demographics of the communities, the age, the occupations, and so forth, the incidence of cancer was what you would expect it to be. The backstory was the administration at the time, the governor's administration at the time, wanted to pass, wanted to enact um, a cigarette tax. So the next, my, nec my next experience, uh, just a couple years later, I found myself doing media, relation media relations at Three Mile Island. And for you, those of you who aren't old enough to remember, that, that was a nuclear plant just south of here on the Susquehanna River. They had a very serious uh, meltdown at one of its reactors, a partial meltdown of the nuclear fuel core, a 100-ton nuclear fuel core. Now, that was a very serious matter. It, there was plenty of reason for concern at the time. But well after it was established, there was much too little radiation release to cause health effects. People were coming forth with all kinds of allegations about health effects. And we, we had at least a dozen studies that contradicted those claims. And for some folks, it didn't matter how many studies you quoted, they weren't satisfied with it. And then finally, in the, in the 1990s, well, not finally, but my next stop was the 1990s, citing a a high voltage uh, uh, electric transmission line across, the, the, across 2,000 properties that covered about two thirds of the length of Pennsylvania. And people were alleging health effects from electromagnetic fields from the high tension lines. Well, again, we had all kinds of studies that contradicted those, those assertions. I had a, one epidemiologist from Penn State who told me, he said, I've been, I've been trying for 20 years to induce health effects from electromagnetic fields, and I've failed miserably. So, you know, so, it, so that, that's how it kind of goes. You have to have, as far as, you know, dealing with the claims behind policy proposals, uh, like the governor's policy proposal for a carbon tax, or like AOC's proposal for a Green New Deal, you really need facts. You have to be at least cognizant of some of the basic facts of the, of the issue. And then I think the first step is to take a look at the premise of the claims and look at what's false about the, the premises and, and what's true. In the case of, say, global warming, uh, you, there's wide acceptance that the Earth's warming. It, it's been warming since the last ice age 10,000 years ago. And there's been plenty of ups and downs of temperature over time. But there's much less support for the assertion that it's man-made global warming that's leading us to catastrophe. And, and, and this claim that there's a 97%, a consensus among 97% of the scientists of, of, such a, a, of such an assertion, it's just, it's just non-existent. There is no such consensus. When that, when that uh, assertion was reviewed, it was found that it was three-tenths of 1%, not 97%, three-tenths of 1% of the scientific abstracts uh, dealing with the subject supported the, uh, the extremist claims, three-tenths of one percent. So many, many scientists disagree with that assertion. And then I think the next step is, is like, what battles are you going to take on? What battles are you going to take on? Uh, you know, in, in the case of global warming, you might not want to get a, into a long argument about what's causing the warming, what isn't causing the warming, the level of CO2, and so forth. It might be simpler for policy matters. It might be simpler and more effective just to stick with attacking uh, the, the supposed solutions that these extremists offer. Because in this case, in the global warming case, the solutions are, some of the solutions at least, are to tax industries, whole industries, into oblivion, raise the price of electricity, all for the supposed benefit of shaving off a few, shaving off 
a few theoretical degrees of temperature in 80 years. Now, what we're saying here is the cost of the quote unquote solutions far exceeds any cost of a few degrees of warming, even if there are any costs. I'm not convinced personally that there are. Uh, and in fact, some of us would go so far as to say that higher temperatures, higher levels of concentrations are actually good for people. So plants certainly grow better uh, with higher temperatures and higher concentrations of, glow, of, of, of CO2. And people, more people, and this is a well-established fact, more people die from cold weather than do, they do from warmth. Mm -hmm. So as far as I'm concerned, we, we should all just relax and go for a nice drive in our SUV in the countryside. <laughs> That's a great idea. Um, but turning, turning here to Pennsylvania a little bit, Representative Dush, um, Governor Wolf believes he has quite a bit of executive authority to push extreme policies without any legislative input. We've seen that very recently in some specific areas around environmental policy and specifically the um, effort to join the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which Gordon just mentioned, um, uh, carbon tax, and that's, that's basically, it's, it's a tax on energy uh, that comes from, uh, from, from fossil fuels. So uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is, <coughs> is, um, is a 10 state organization that uh, requires um, energy producers to purchase exchanges for um, the carbon dioxide they admit, emit. And that has just moved. Uh, the governor is pushing it through a regulatory policy. Um, and I just wonder if you could, you could fill us in on how he's doing that, how we got here. Um, no legislative approval was required in his opinion. Can you fill us in a little bit on the, state, the status of things here in Pennsylvania? Yes, and thank you. The unique thing is that every other state in the Reggie Compact, and it is a compact despite uh, arguments from the governor to the contrary, uh, it's happened by legislative authority. And <clears throat> going back to Woodrow Wilson's time, the, uh, uh, Wilson con convinced the uh, legislature at the federal level to start writing broad sweeping pieces of legislation eliminating uh, or diluting the preambles to the pieces of legislation so that the authority could be delegated to the executive branch in such a way that the uh, executive branches could start writing regulations that had the force of law. Well, the uh, federal legislature caught on real quick that, you know what, if I do that, then the executive branch starts writing the regulation and when the, the constituents come to you and say, hey, you, this is wrong, you say, well, that's not what I voted for. Uh, you can drive a truck through those preambles anymore, or a locomotive for that matter. But uh, then the constituent says, well, you've got to do something about it. Well, that's uh, uh, separation of powers and you're del or getting into the executive authority. Well, it's the only their authority by way of statute from the law, from the legislature. Uh, and for far too long, legislators have become comfortable having the positions and not having that, uh, uh, the guts to stand up and actually write pieces of legislation that are specific enough so that when you're doing something that's contrary to the, uh, the benefit of the people, then they can fire you. Uh, I've been trying to get that fixed for a long time. But unfortunately, what's going on now is Governor Wolf, and he's showing it not just with uh, Reggie, he is taking on more and more of the legislative uh, role. And unfortunately, the court in Pennsylvania uh, lately has been giving them the ability to do that. Uh, it was never intended. We are a republic. Uh, the rights of the people uh, to acquire property, uh, the governor has been trampling on that, and the same thing goes with our, uh, uh, our ability to produce energy. I, you know, it, it astounds me that I had legislators uh, telling me that, well, that coal and natural gas, it belongs to the people. I'm sorry, but the, uh, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania sold those rights. They sold those to uh, private individuals, and they and their uh, descendants own that property. And uh, this governor and, unfortunately, these, uh, the, 
one of the sacraments of secular, secular humanism is environmentalism. And, you know, Pennsylvania was blessed. We've had a lot of great conservationists uh, from Governor Pinchot to up in my uh, area, uh, Edward Abbey gained national uh, fame. Uh, uh, the Cook family have Cook Forest up there where we still have the, the only old growth forest east of the Mississippi. Uh, beautiful lands and spectacular resources. But there's a difference between a conservation and environmentalist, and it's the mental part of the environmentalist. Uh, as I said, it's a religion, it's, and it's, this is one of the sacraments of the secular humanism. So we're, the governor has uh, vetoed the bill that we passed uh, earlier to remind him that it is the legislature that has that authority, and the legislature alone. Um, but, and he's going to try and continue. Uh, there is good cause for legal action. Uh, this Pennsylvania Supreme Court, uh, unfortunately, has shown over and over again it's willing to let the governor run roughshod over our constitutional rights and also to write their own pieces of legislation. So it's gonna, right now it's gonna be up to the federal courts until we get through an election or two and we get some people in that have the guts in the legislature to finally stand up and jealously guard the sovereignty of the people and the legislature. Great. I, I, I think the thing that's most amazing to me is the governor can argue his authority under the environmental statutes. Um, but it's hard to argue that, that Reggie is not a tax. And we know that the legislature has the ability to, only the legislature has yes. the ability to levy a tax. So in, from my perspective, it seems like it comes down to that. Um, and it, it's un, unbelievable to me that we are where we are here with that. And but If I, if I sure. may, uh, that's why in every other state that's in Reggie, it hasn't been done by the act of a single individual. Mm -hmm. It is a legislative act. Every other state that's in Reggie understands that. But... Uh, and so it was never enacted by an edict from a governor. Right. So, like I said, we've got to start getting people in other positions that are willing to enforce that. Sounds good. Well, anytime we question policies like Reggie or any other environmental policy, conservatives are accused of being anti-environment. And as you said, there's a difference maybe between conservation and environmentalism. Um, but in any case, we're uh, considered anti-environment. Anytime we have a criticism or bring up any of the arguments or points that you've all suggested. Um, but we know the environment is cleaner today than it has been in our lifetimes. And there's no doubt about that. It's hard to make that argument, though, when you're presented, you're presented with the daily deluge of uh, doom and gloom, uh, like we said earlier. It really is a challenge to keep the discussion positive and productive uh, from our perspective. So, um, Gordon, what are some key takeaways that you have about the progress we've made on the environment? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, I'll mention one writer here, and I think we're going to put up a list a little later of some recommended readings, but Alex Epstein wrote a book a couple years ago called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, and that led him to then talk about human flourishing, and others have talked about this subject, but the fact is um, the human condition and the environment have, have, made, have been progressing in a very positive way ever since wood uh, was replaced by coal as a, as a dominant fuel in, in, in 18th century England. At one time, because of overuse, wood was very scarce, became very scarce in England, and, and an order went out that homes had to be built of brick rather than wood. It turns out that it, it aggravated the situation because it took more wood to uh, make the bricks than to build the homes. So, that didn't really work out too well. And I think, actually, I think the guy who issued that edict was the same guy who closed the bathrooms on the Pennsylvania Turnpike at the beginning of the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> Unintended consequences. I mean, who knew that commercial, the drivers of commercial vehicles went to the bathroom like every other human being? I don't <laughs> Amazing. But for me, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution uh, starts basically when, when steam engines were put into wide use to drain uh, 
water from coal mines in England. And then, of course, coal became the primary fuel for steam engines. And then since then, we've seen oil and natural gas replace coal for many applications. And then, uh, more recently, uh, nuclear power has been introduced as a, as a means of generating electricity. So it has been the responsible and rather remarkable development of fossil energy, fossil fuels, that has created the most prosperous, the most prosperous civilization that has ever existed and the longest, the longest of human lives ever enjoyed. And, and these are positive developments that are absolutely ignored by environmental, environmental extremists when, when they talk about, when they exaggerate uh, the negative effects of, of these industrial activities. And I can't name one industrial activity. It doesn't have some negative effect. But by golly, in a free market, it doesn't exist for very long, but it doesn't produce more benefits than negatives. That's just the way it works, and you can't get around that. Uh, in my lifetime, and as you mentioned uh, before, I think, Rebecca, in my lifetime, just in Pennsylvania, thousands of miles of streams, once polluted and utterly lifeless, have cleared up, are yielding <clears throat> fish, attracting ospreys, eagles, and kayakers. And, and that's, just, that's just in my lifetime. And, and it's been a continued development of fossil fuels and nuclear power that will give us more of these kinds of benefits and, and, and benefits and, and lifestyles that we can't even imagine right now. And I'm convinced that if we're allowed to make rational, um, positive developments of, of, of these fuels, that, that billions of people who now still, to this day, don't have enough electricity to run a refrigerator, don't have enough electricity uh, to, to, to pump water and spend men, women and children, girls, spend hours and hours a day carrying water because they can't pump it. They, and people still are using wood and animal dung to cook and heat. Th these are the people that really suffer when you institute idiotic energy policies. So I'm, m my view is the future is very, very bright for the world as long as we have rational energy policies and don't allow irrational policies to, to drag us back to the dark ages. Well, we, we've certainly made a lot of progress, uh, Representative Dash. How do we communicate that progress? How do we move forward? And what do you think is going right? Well, I think people are finally starting to wake up to uh, a lot of the, uh, the misinformation. Uh, as you both alluded to earlier, uh, just since uh, 1967, I've got over 40 uh, instances where things such as uh, everyone will disappear in a cloud of blue steam, uh, 1968, Ice Age by 2000 from 1970, new Ice Age coming by 2020 or 2030, uh, and those were all in the early 70s, and then uh, acid rain will kill all life in lakes, and that hasn't happened. Uh, no in sight for a 30-year uh, cooling trend as late as 1978. And then uh, the Maldive Islands will be underwater by 2018. Guess what? They're not. They're not. <laughs> uh, and this stuff is all, all these predictions are coming out of the universities. And uh, we're facing it even today. Uh, uh, Professor Mann up at Penn State he purposely left the medieval warming period out of his uh, graph, the hockey stick graph. Yeah. Um, that was a worldwide warming period. The uh, Leif Erikson and his father, Eric the Red, uh, were, and they had mature vineyards in Greenland. It was called Greenland for a reason. I mean, it's not a nice, if it was like it is today, they'd be calling it I the larger Iceland, greater Iceland or something like that. Um, and there was no power, there were no power plants around at that time. You take a look at the, what is being ignored in science like uh, coal. I mean, we, I, coal's a fossil fuel. You break it apart, you can see ferns, you can see all sorts of bark material and stuff like that. But guess what? When they do radiocarbon dating on it, it's six to 8,000 years old. It's not millions of years old. It is a recently formed fossil. And that carbon, as late as six to six, 8,000 years ago, was in the air. 
Uh, and yet, here we are on the Earth. That stuff is being purposely left out of the scientific discussion. It's purposely left out of our textbooks, uh, both in the high school and the university level. Uh, we need to start confronting that and start ensuring that real science and is put in and that we're not ignoring it. Uh, there, this is from the Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change. There are, this is one of four volumes on climate change reconsidered. These are all peer-reviewed summaries of, uh, of scientific research papers that were done that explicitly refute uh, in a lot of cases, and they're, they're intellectually honest in them. If you go in and uh, review them, like, I, I mean, there's no way I've done them all, but if you go in and review them, you'll see where they do have agreements in some areas, but uh, the predominant uh, consensus is quite the opposite of what we're trying, to be, what they're trying to peddle on us, just like they were with global cooling, just like they were with overpopulation, all these other things, uh, there, we'd be out of food. I think it was what uh, one famous uh, university professor that was quoted over and over mm -hmm. again uh, was saying back in the late 60s and early 70s. And yet here we are with about three times the population and uh, we don't have the types of starvation that they were describing. Well, I think that's uh, one a great point to uh, point out the, the importance of market innovation and human ingenuity. Yes. I think, I mean, uh, Gordon mentioned Thomas Malthus. Um, obviously, we're not overrunning the earth because our, our um, ability to produce food has come so far just within the past several decades that we're able to feed uh, the, most of the people of the world here. And um, just with uh, energy, energy production, like we've mentioned, and uh, energy efficiency even, we could go on and on as to what the um, human ingenuity has brought to, to the table here that I think people uh, tend to discount when they, when they come out with these uh, doom and gloom scenarios. So um, do you, uh, either of you do, you, do you see a way to sort of break through the gridlock uh, that we have right now on um, conservation and an environmental area? Is there, can we find areas that we can agree on? Or do you think we really just need to focus on um, countering some of the more extreme environmentalism? Well, my, my own view is we have the high ground. The facts mm -hmm. are on our side. Um, and, and I think we need to fearlessly defend our positions and not apologize for our, our industries, whether they be coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, what, what have you, fracking. Um, in fact, I think I just signed something where I'm supposed to get, like, uh, I'm fracking voting or something like that. <laughs> There's a campaign going on. But, and, and what I, I've been seeing just recently, the last, I guess, year or two, I've been reading some books and seeing some videos where there have been um, former, you know, formerly anti-nuclear, anti-fossil fuel types, and some of them very prominent types, uh, the founder, one of the founders of Greenpeace is one of them, who, who have kind of flipped around. Uh, there's a, a, I think it's a two or three year old video documentary right now called Pandora's Promise, where they have five former anti-nuclear activists uh, being interviewed throughout this documentary. And now they're, they've embraced nuclear power as the uh, uh, dominant energy source of the future, and uh, they're, I, I, don't, I don't think they're bad-mouthing much fossil, fossil energy e either for that matter. In fact, one, one, of the, one of the people that appear in that, that documentary, he's written a book just this year, published it, called Apocalypse Never. His name's Michael Schellenberger, and uh, he resides on the West Coast, has an institute of something or other, but, but he's quoted in that video saying, uh, this is a former anti-nuclear activist. He says, the idea that we're going to replace oil and coal and natural gas with solar and wind and nothing else is, an, is a hallucinatory delusion. <laughs> so that's about as clear as you can get. Uh, you know, he's kind of seen the light. And as I think Chris has just indicated, I think more and more people are beginning to. But we have to stand firm. Anything you want to add to close yes. out our discussion? <clears throat> we have to stay positive. First of all, we do have the high ground. The, the fact that we are conservationists, we absolutely want 
to have clean water, clean air, uh, great environment, and we're showing it up in the oil and gas patch and in the coal uh, industry. Uh, these people are members of Trout Unlimited, uh, Pheasants Forever, uh, the people who are on, in, on that, in those industries, but they're in it because they love it. It's not for uh, some political benefit. These guys are actually out there because they enjoy being out in the woods, they enjoy the clean water, the clean streams, and they enjoy the break and be in the way to dro th drop a line in the water and enjoy the, uh, the wildlife. But that's great. where we need to stay. Yeah, well, thank you for the discussion. This was, was a great conversation. But I think, you know, it's, it's not going to go away anytime soon. I think you're right. We're, we're on the winning side, but, but we still have, to, still have to keep up the fight here. So I guess part of the answer, as we discussed, is just to keep things in perspective, keep a realistic view of where we are, focus on the positive, and arm yourself with information. Correct. Now, I think um, Gordon had some um, resources that, that we're going to put up on the screen, I think, and share uh, that might be helpful for someone wants, who wants to check out um, some alternative environmental um, perspectives. Yeah. Correct? Right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. We had a great uh, discussion, and uh, we'll, we'll keep up the fight. Appreciate climate, the opportunity. Climate Change Reconsidered, too. Uh, that's also a good website to go to. Fantastic. All right. Thank you.